Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Aura, the all-in-one application that protects your safety online powered by AI. Honestly, it is worse to just be a human that exists on the internet from a safety perspective than it ever has been before. I'm constantly getting weird scam phone calls from everyone. I'm sure you guys do too. There are lots of weird phishing attempts that are made to internal employees at Blockworks and on Twitter. So I have to do these posts that, hey, I'll never ask you for money. It just is terrible. The actual statistics is that one in four people now fall victim to cybercrime. And if you operate in crypto, it is even worse. You are more at risk. That's why we're happy to partner up with Aura here. And I'm going to be telling you all about them later in the show. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security-first, compliance-focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. But for now, Mantra, thanks for making this episode possible. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, we've got two repeat guests and friends of the pod, Jim Pianco and Eric Balkunas. Guys, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, guys, it's going to be a blast. We're going to be talking all things Bitcoin ETF. And uh, this is going to be a little bit of a discussion, a little bit of a date, uh, debate, uh, and I'm very excited to have it. And Jim, maybe I'll, I'll just kick things off. Um, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago, you know, I've been following some of your recent tweets. Um, and I think you sparked quite a bit of attention when you made this distinction. There was a thread you made a couple of weeks ago about, uh, you know, you sort of classified these two different types of ETF investors that exist in the traditional ETF complex and might be relevant for determining who is actually buying the Bitcoin ETF today? And you segment that as DGENs and allocators. So could you maybe just give everyone who missed that tweet that a frame, like your sort of framework for the two types of ETF buyers that exist and who you think are bu is buying the Bitcoin ETFs today? And let's talk about what we know and what we don't know about ETF. ETFs are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or they're listed on the NASDAQ. That's virtually all of them right now. There's 3,400 of them. They're 44% of all the listings on the stock exchanges are ETFs. Um, when you list an ETF, you really don't know who buys or sells them. You have informed opinion. You can ask people close to the situation. But unless that ETF buyer or seller literally phones you up and says, I just bought your fund or I just sold your fund, you really don't know. I, I Look, I know a lot of ETF players and I know a lot of ETF players that sit around and go, man, we just got a big inflow. And we don't know who it is. And we're waiting for somebody who did it to contact us and tell us that they did it. And often they do and often they don't. So um, the reason I bring that up is let's start off in the first hand. We don't have absolute statistics on who's doing what. We have informed opinion. That's all we have right now. And so what I've been expressing is an informed opinion. And I want to put out one other thing about the informed opinion. And this is something that Eric tweets out all the time. What we're seeing in the Bitcoin ETFs as a collective group is unprecedented. So while I could say, well, you know, typically it's A, B, or C, we've never seen, you know, this type of rush into a set of ETFs um, in the first two months. So it could be completely unlike anything we have ever seen in the ETF industry, or it could just be what we typically see on steroids. And we're still struggling to try and figure that out. So <clears throat> what I've been arguing is whenever I see a big rush of money into ETFs, like we did in XIV, which was the short volatility funds, like we did in USO, and I'm picking those for a particular reason, the United States oil fund, um, like we saw last year, about this time last year with all of the Chinese funds, it is typically what I would refer to as a, a weak-handed player. They're there for the trade. They're there for the quick profit. It might be a hedge fund. It might be an asset manager. It might be a retail investor, although whatever retail investor typically means. But it is what a, I don't think it is when you see this type of rush in the door. Now, I'm not saying, you know, absolute, but I don't think it's being dominated by the strong handed, um, you know, person who is committed to the space that is coming through a wealth manager. And this whole idea that it's all boomers going through their wealth manager. I don't think it's that. I think it can be that over time. One last thing about wealth managers. I want to make a quick statement about wealth managers straight up because I think the ETF community doesn't get this because they're always tweeting out, you know, have fun staying poor. People that go to a wealth manager, they're not poor. And why do they go to a wealth manager? Because the wealth manager's first job is to not make them poor. 
They're not going to a wealth manager saying, hey, I've got $30 million. Can you turn it into $400 million? No, they're saying to the wealth manager, I got $30 million. Don't make it 10 is basically what their first job is. And so they're not rushing into NVIDIA or they're not rushing into the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, they might might over time pl- over time play around with it. And in the context that I've had with wealth managers, one of which I've shared with Eric, I'm not hearing a lot of wealth managers beating the door down with their with their wealthy clients to buy this. So I keep coming back to it's more of the trading kind of community. It's more of the short term weak handed players. Now, now that I've said that, it's going to push the price up. And it's going to continue to push the price up. What's the harm in that? The last thought is the harm in that, and that's why I used USO and XIV. You are trading a did you are trading on a centralized exchange, these digital assets, and we've already seen Coinbase struggling to keep their systems up because of what, of what because of all these heavy flows. The reason I picked those two examples, um, United States Oil Fund used to buy front end futures contracts. And there was kind of a, a design flaw in it. And when we wound up in April of 2020, when they had to roll the contract, they produced a minus $40 on the front end of, of crude oil futures. We all probably remember that and didn't understand why that happened. XIV, which was the short fund. Eric, you t- tweeted that out the other day. It was going straight up, straight up, straight up and lost 95% of its money in like one minute or something like that or one day. Um, and there was a design flaw in that. And what I'm fearing is if this is all short-term money and you don't have in-kind transfer, we'll talk about that and I'll give Eric a chance to chime in on what I said, that on the downside, when everybody rushes for the exits, we're going to see the design flaw show up in this thing and it could be kind of ugly on the other side. So when people ask me, what is it going to prove that I'm wrong? I want to see it go down 20 or 30%. And I want to see no meaningful outflows. I don't want to see a big rush for the exits if it goes down 20 or 30%. Tuesday's five-hour sell-off wasn't what I was looking for to say, no, I misjudged it. I want to see something along those lines. I'm thinking more towards the beginning of February because right in January 11th to the beginning of February, it did sell off 21%. In the entire first week of February, net outflows for five straight days. So that's what I want to see. I want to see a big sell-off and I want to see that these funds the people that own these aren't rushing for the exits and compounding the problem. So there's my my uh, my my story in a nutshell. A couple things here. First of all, um, I think what I do agree with. I think the retail buying has been greater than anybody thought. Um, if you look at the number of trades and the size of the trades, clearly there's a lot of retail being buying the Bitcoin ETF. Um, I would say that this retail. Typically, a a retail investor who uses ETFs is not the GameStop ape type. Uh, In my opinion, these are usually a little more with it because they know what an ETF is. They know it's cheap. Usually, ETFs, generally, you have to find them, right? They're not not like really paying much for uh, distribution. So generally, ETF investors are a little more savvy than, say, the GameStop. Number two, when you think about uh, Bitcoin, I think... Um, and this is something that I've been prophesizing for about five, six years. And it's something that I made a call on around ARC that I nailed. And it was a hard call to make, but I was right. That the more Vanguard and low cost beta takes over the core of portfolios, right? So you have a base of like serious investor adult assets. The more you look for stuff that's completely different, you you have a, in my opinion, a hot sauce bucket. Now, That could mean a Robinhood account. It could mean trading stocks. It could mean options. It could mean ARC. It could mean thematic ETFs. To me, Bitcoin fits perfectly there. So I see these retail investors, especially given the size of the trades, as putting in like 1% of their portfolio or less. Now, the reason that matters is that my assumption, and I think I'm right, most of these people probably have a base 401k type, you know, where their serious money is. Therefore, this they will have more tolerance when there's a sell-off because this isn't the whole enchilada, right? This is just a portion of the portfolio. And now some people may be like, well, the stock market's selling off too. Let me get rid of my Bitcoin first because I don't want to sell my stock market. Maybe there'll be a little of that. If we have a precedent of ARC, there was clearly everybody's like, wait till the music stops. It's going to be a run, like a bank run. 
None of that happened. ARC actually took in a, a little bit of money net over the next year. Now, they've been treading water since. It's not like they're killing it again. But just the fact that they survived an 80% drawdown, I think speaks to the nature of portfolios and how they've changed and the nature of the tolerance of volatility from somebody who has a 60-40 core. Not everybody is going to be this person. I get it. So I think in a drawdown, let's say it's 20-30% over a couple months, I think you see certain ETFs are used more by traders like IBIT. So IBIT could have like uh, maybe an institution or some traders who get out quickly or maybe they short it real quick. So IBIT could see a little more up and down flows, sort of like SPY does. I think FBTC and these other ones will be a little more secure. These to me seem like more long-term money. Fidelity is probably using their advisory network. IBIT is probably going to be like the GLD. And like, you know, it goes up and down, there's flows in and out. But net, if we take any long net period, it's typically net inflows. But even in 2008, like SPY had like three months of outflows, but then six months of inflows, it netted out to positive. So I think there will be some outflows here and there, especially on IBIT, again, because it's most liquid, it's going to attract the most traders. But to me, this is all just sort of like normal. I think what I don't think is going to happen is some crazy run on, on the... Um, on the ETF. And in terms of the design flaws, you know, I think junk bond ETFs gave us a little bit of, um, of what something that's illiquid in a liquid wrapper will do. But again, investors are pretty well behaved in every sell off. They didn't go crazy selling HYG, little selling, but not crazy. And so I even look at like spy in 2008, HYG during 2020. Um, there, there will be times where things are strained. I just don't think the ETF investor, be that retailer advisor, is as weak handed as the implication. I think because of the other dynamics I'm mentioning, I think they're going to be stronger holders than people think. I think, and this is how I, somebody like me would buy this. Let me just put 1% in it. I don't want to kick myself if it goes to a million. And, and if it goes up, down, if it goes down and my look at my wife and like, hey, Bitcoin's down 20%. I'm like, well... We, we did we did go up 30% before that. And who who cares? Remember, this is long-term. It's done this before. Just keep it. I just think that's how the mentality is going to go with most people. I don't think they're going to see Bitcoin, Bitcoin go down 20% and be somehow shocked that this is what happens. The other thing is having the, knowing you have this like really strong core, I think gives you a little more stomach uh, for volatility in general in that hot sauce bucket. Um, like an ARC. XIV is interesting. I suppose you have a point there because that was somewhat piled into by speculative retail. But I will say that like was an ETN that used futures and USO also used futures. I think that is important. And that went down like 90% in two days. That that was crazy. And I just don't know if Bitcoin will, will have that kind of a uh, issue. Um, I do worry about Coinbase a little because they're having these outages. Um, if anything, I think Coinbase actually promotes the ETF a little bit because ETFs don't like shut down. Like they'll trade through almost anything because they're, they're on these gigantic exchanges that, in fact, if anything, Coinbase shutting down and the ETFs trading is sort of like a win for TradFi, in my opinion, because it just shows the robustness of the TradFi system. So I think the Coinbase shutting down, though, to your point, Jim, you know, as long as the assets are custody there, they don't like get lost. Uh, you know, I just think, I sometimes think you might have a little point there because Coinbase has shut down. That's kind of a different question. Like, is Coinbase up for this? But in general, I just don't think we'll ever see a moment where there's like 90% of the assets running for the exits because I just haven't really seen it in any other ETF. Even XIV, believe it or not, it wasn't that everybody left. In fact, everybody was taking profits as they went. Um, it's just that it went down 90% and had a termination event. USO is uh, also an interesting example because I do believe that's also a trade where people probably were normal people who thought oil's low. I like the story. I want to buy it. They didn't understand Contango. And USO ended up buying too much of the front month and had an issue and had to diversify. But even in the case of USO, they did work it out. USO is actually less effective now because it holds all the futures. It actually was better as a front month with a, an, a, I don't know, some issue every 10 years. But anyway, I agree. There are sometimes these cases where an ETF is in a small pond and it gets big. 
you know, spy won't have this issue because it's a big fish in a big pond. But if you're in a small pond like um, USO and the front month of those futures, and there's like a, a piling in, I just don't know if Bitcoin's that small of a pond. I also give some reliance to some of the size of these issuers, um, the Fidelities and Black Rocks of the world. There is such a um, motivation for them not to fuck this up. Like they, this would be a massive PR issue. And so I do trust a little bit in their reputation in working these different areas. BlackRock doesn't do oil futures. They don't do XIV, but they did decide to do this. So I'm going to give them some credit for checking it out. They don't want like a massive stain on the reputation um, because we all know they'd get a lot of the blame for this. So those would be some of my pushbacks. Um, it's possible I'm wrong. I would have to eat a lot of crow for sure. But you've made other good points in this, in the decentralized versus centralized. Yeah. I agree with, I think these are almost like internal dilemmas that the crypto crowd has to wrestle with because you are sort of centralizing Bitcoin to a degree here. But when it comes to the strength or the um, discipline of ETF investors, they tend to prove people wrong more than not. Hey everyone, we partnered with Aura for this episode to keep on the margin listeners safe from cybercrime. I talked about it at the top of this episode, but cybercrime and phishing scams have basically become the bane of my existence. I get 10 spam calls every single day, every day. And I'm sure you guys do too. And my co-founder Yano has actually been hacked multiple times, you know, knock on wood, God forbid this past year. So it's just never been less safe to operate on the internet, especially if you work in crypto, it's particularly tough. That's why we partnered up with Aura, which is an all-in-one app that provides protection for your identity, financial accounts, passwords, devices, all of that stuff. Now, the benefit of Aura, there are many benefits, but one, it's AI. So you immediately get notifications if someone is trying to hack into your bank account, social media, whatever it is. So you know really quick. But in addition to that, what they do is they will actually help you solve the problem. So with 24-7 US-based support and dedicated resolution agents, Aura will actually be there every step of the way to help you resolve whatever is happening on the fraud front. And for a limited time, because Aura just loves on the margin and you guys as listeners, uh, we are getting a free 14-day trial plus 55% off an Aura subscription when you visit Aura.com slash Blockworks. Only get that discount if you go to Aura.com slash Blockworks, which we've linked in the description. So go check them out. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first, compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions into Web3. So you guys heard me talk about Larry Fink talking about tokenization. You've seen the clips on CNBC. You know that Larry and BlackRock are very, very excited about this idea. And the reason for that is they're looking at these trillions of dollars of off-chain real world assets. They want to digitize those and bring them on chain, which is going to be a massive opportunity but in order to do that, they need a compliant L1, and that's where Mantra comes in. Mantra has been steadily climbing the ranks and now stands among the top four RWA projects on CoinGecko, which is representative of its rapid growth and influence in the tokenization space. Mantra is built using the Cosmos SDK, so they have some very cool stuff out of the box. They've got IBC interoperability. They also leverage Cosmwasm smart contracts. Very cool design from an architectural standpoint. The next phase on the blockchain's testnet is Hongbai, so that's launching soon. So if you're a uh, adapt developer or something like that. There's a lot of very cool opportunities for you. And I highly recommend that you click the link at the bottom of the show notes. I don't know that I sent you. Uh, thanks very much again, Mantra, for making this possible. And again, guys, click the link at the bottom of the show notes. So a couple of things. Uh, I agree with virtually everything you said. And I want to emphasize a few things for, for everybody that when you talk about hot sauce, you know, the, um, the phrase I've heard of it is, you know, the Christmas tree ornament that, you know, your base, your base portfolio is you own some bond funds and you own some stock funds. That's the Christmas tree. And then you stick some you stick some ornaments on it. And <clears throat> well, one of the ornaments, you know, we're arguing here could be the Bitcoin ETFs. And by the way, what's really growing in the um, ETF space is active management. You know, so you know, I, um, and I think the active managers are starting to figure this out too. That people are looking for five percent. You know, I want to invest in AI, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and it's a it's an unknown area. So Go find me some active, some guy that presents himself as an expert in it, and I'll invest in his fund. Um, so there's there is a there is a lot of that um, as well. So I have two questions for you, Eric. Question one, <clears throat> I'm concerned about, and is Tuesday we had 709,000 trades, 33 trades a second. People misunderstood my tweet about that. Was that this thing has mushroomed out to the point where? The TPS, the transactions per second on the Bitcoin blockchain, couldn't handle it. It's, it doesn't move that fast. And that this thing moves that fast, 
When I see 33 trades or 700,000 trades in a day between all 10 ETFs, which is more than SPY and QQQ combined, yeah, doesn't that scream short-term degen trading would be my first question. And my second question, which is somewhat related to it is, <clears throat> and I know this will get kind of in the weeds, in-kind transfers, is that what an in-kind transfer is, if you go to sell it and BlackRock or Coinbase has a problem, this is would be in a typical ETF. Yep. They can hand you the underlying securities. They can just say, look, you know, this is what really solved the HYG problem. HYG is the high yield ETF. The high yield ETFs trade like 90% the volume of the of the high yield cash market. If you um if you look at the trade securities volume numbers. And why didn't that ever have a problem? Because they do they do a lot of crates and redeems in that market. What they do is when you sell it, they'll just hand you the bonds. They will give you the underlying bonds as opposed to giving you the cash that you sold. But because they've banned in-kind transfers with ETFs, you sell IBIT, and then they, instead of giving, they have to give you the money instead of saying, here's the coins, that in a, in a downtrend, if Coinbase or the like has a problem, the fund, doesn't the fund risk a loss? You let me out at $25 just to pick a number. And Coinbase can't get me out at $25. And the price keeps falling and falling and falling. And then they get me out at $24. But you promised me $25. You sold them at $24. You got to take a $1 loss. That's the risk. That's the design flaw. I hope I'm wrong on, which has got me very worried. So what do you think about 700,000 trades? And what do you think about the design flaw in a decentralized asset like this? Um, th and that's what's got me worried about the downtrend. To be very honest with you, last off with you, if they had in-kind transfers, I'd be much less worried because in a downtrend, they could say, hey, the market's selling off really hard. They'll just hand you your Bitcoin. They'll say, look, you sold it here. They'll hand you your Bitcoin and they're done, but they can't do that. Looking through this, I think one of the things going on is, because you know what else traded a lot was Bitto. Bitto broke its record. And who the hell would want a Bitcoin futures ETF right now when you have spot? And I think what's going on is a lot of the trading is arbing. People yeah. just have algo set up between them. And anytime one of them gets a little out of whack, they just arb it. I think they're actually arbing exchange prices, futures, bido, uh, the spot products. Because the amount of flows that have been converted from the volume is also something like 20%. And in a new product, it should be a little more like 50, 60, even 70 so I think a lot of this is algos because Bitto has no business seeing record volume and uh, the one that goes inverse as well. So the Bitcoin futures ETFs um, are just seeing a ton of volume and GBTC also. GBTC seeing a lot of volume is interesting because I don't know, is, is anybody buying this fresh? Probably not. And if the people who are leaving, it's like a giant investor, they're probably doing that in, in not a million trades, but just a couple. So I think also GBTC's volume is a little overblown because of this algo thing going on, uh, the arbing between the products. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it. I don't, I would think that if if we are in a year from now, 95% of the trading will be on exchange, on the stock exchange, and maybe only 5% would involve the actual Bitcoin. So I don't know how much this trading would even matter because like in like high yield or any category, that number is usually like 95 to five. Like there's very little times where the, the stock, the ETFs trading in the secondary market actually trigger a flow, which would then make it have to deal with the Bitcoin. So I think those two things can live in harmony. I mean, that's part of why the first ETF was invented, SPY, is the SEC saw that futures kind of messed up the stock market in the Black, Black Monday. And they thought, they're, they're really, what if there was a market basket instrument trading here that wasn't futures that people could use as a liquidity source and, and not have to deal with the underlying. And so the ETF was almost born to create this like alternative liquidity, a liquidity area that wouldn't have to deal with the underlying. And it, they kind of do that, like in a sell-off, like you'll see people use HYG or TLT or um, SPY obviously, or I don't know, um, Muni bond fund as a place to find out where their market is and have a liquidity area. So I think Bitcoin will serve that purpose. If Bitcoin, if the underlying market has an issue, that's gonna be a problem. Like if they halt creations or redemptions, that is a code red for ETFs. It's happened a couple times. It's possible, I guess, I would have to see more and dive into this, but 
that could that could still even happen with a bond fund. Like if if cities stop doing creations or something like that, um, even one AP, that could have a, a really crazy effect. And every now and then Barclays stops doing creations on VXX and they just like decide to not or do uh, any new creations because for whatever reason, they don't feel like it. Um, so if creations or redemptions are halted for any ETF, I would say that's a code red. The media is going to be all over it. I, they're going to really work hard to never have that happen. The other, the other thing though, if there is a scarcity of Bitcoin, and let's say there's not a lot of Bitcoin and a lot of people do want to get out, what that's going to do is just send the price of Bitcoin down further. So I do think one thing we are seeing that, that I'm starting to notice is I don't, I'm trying to get numbers on this. You guys might know better, but there's all, there's what, how, what's the market cap of Bitcoin right now? Like 1.5 trillion or. Yeah. It was like 1.3 1, 1. and change or so. 1.3, I think. So okay. how much of that Bitcoin is float? Like available? Uh, I got, yeah, the glass note has those debt data and I'll give you two numbers. The number of co- the number of coins that have not moved in the last three months, to, so that have not moved since um, uh, since the uh, ETF started trading is eighty three percent. So only seventeen percent of the float has moved during that period. So that's like 200, 210 billion. If you want to go with a standard number, like the last year, yeah, about thirty percent of the float turns over in a year. So that's the other issue is that is the effective float yeah. of Bitcoin really like 250 or 300 billion and not yes. 1.3 trillion? So this this to me is going to just create volatility, in my opinion. So I don't see a design issue where we can't you can't get your Bitcoin out or you can't get cashed out if you want to leave. But what's going to happen is the price is going to deviate more wildly because there's just less float. And I think the ETFs have only taken in like $9 billion, but the market cap of Bitcoin's up, what, like $500 billion? Because the price impact's going to be way greater if there's less float. So we see this sometimes with, um, you know, GameStop was sort of like this. You, you could hijack GameStop because it, there just wasn't that much GameStop shares. Um, in a bigger stock, which has more float, it's harder for the indexes and ETFs to have much of an effect on it. But in this case, if the float is smaller, and there's not a lot of people willing to trade, the price will have to go increasingly higher or lower for someone to be satisfied. So <clears throat> that's real, I think. And at some point, the ETFs, how big can they get? How much do they start moving the price of Bitcoin like more greatly than they should or would today? Definitely issues, but I don't really ever see a scenario. And this is why, at the end of the day, the reason ETFs were invented was because they really wanted futures that were backed by something, right? That was ultimately, let's, the SEC is like, let's not rely on the, on the Chicago traded futures because they had become insurance. Let's, let's have something that actually stores the stuff. And so it's almost like the custodian ETFs are receipts. So at the end of the day, your Bitcoin ETF shares are a receipt to Bitcoin stored. If there's a problem, yes, all kinds of hell is going to break loose, I'm sure but you still own that Bitcoin per that receipt. So it's not like it's, this is why it's SBF proof. It's not like the money's gone. It's like literally sitting in a custodian. So that's why I don't go crazy worrying about it. Same with junk bonds. Okay, fine, there's a huge sell-off, there's a discount. At the end of the day though, you do own those junk bonds. Your, your shares are a receipt to the underlying. And that's what makes them a little less scary than say a traditional derivative. Um, but I guess I'll end there, but w- to your point, in kind would be way better. Can I ask one quick question? We can move on real quick. Um, Eric, t- typically Bitcoin, um, ETF investors are insanely price sensitive. They're like people searching for gas prices to the lowest gas price. Uh, I've attributed that the relentless outflows out of GBDC is not necessarily Genesis, which everybody keeps saying, but it's just that they're charging 150 basis points. And a lot of that money is just mi- saying, I'll, I'll go into something else that's got a much, much lower fee. Would you agree with that? Uh, where do you come down on it? How much of that um, gen- uh, GBT selling do you think is Genesis versus just, why don't I just trade into a, a cheaper uh, ETF? And I, I want to pile I want to pile on that as well, because Eric, the last time you and I talked, this was pre the Bitcoin ETFs launching. And you mentioned that GBTC was going to have this massive advantage launching with 25 billion in AUM. And there's this virtuous cycle about the amount of assets and the volume, and they kind of feed on each other. And so one thing I've been wondering, looking at GBTC is to 
Jim's point, and I'd love to get your color on like where you think those outflows are coming from, but is there a negative feedback loop that kicks in as the AUM starts to uh, flow out of the fund? So yeah, so I can't remember, GBTC coming in with a lot of volume was a big advantage, but that advantage was completely destroyed by their fee. Like if they had come in at 50 basis, even somewhere near, I think that volume would have been a bigger advantage for them. But because they were 1.5%, it kind of killed their huge advantage of having all this volume on day one. Um, it's a big fee. I mean, compared to 20 basis points, this is bigger than gas shopping. To, you know, I had a chapter in my last book called The Power of One dot 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 basis point because VU and IVV would cut their fee from four to three and it would move money. One basis point. So you're right. So 150 to 20 is like crazy. And so I do, I, there's definitely people switching. The only two things I would say is, I would say maybe it's half, 40% to half. There were a couple chunk things that had to be taken out of GBTC. Also, there was a ton of hedge funds and traders that played that discount ARB. They all had to take their profits and leave too. So I, and I'm ballparking. I've talked to GBTC too. And I'd say half maybe is people switching. I think it's maybe a little less than people think. So that's why the net flows into the Bitcoin ETFs is 9 billion, but you might add another four or five because that would be the fresh money, 15, in my opinion, um, because only half can be accounted from GBTC's outflows. But the GBTC people who are in there, I think a lot of them have done the math and they're like, if I, if I sell, the capital gains tax is so much that it'd be cheaper to stay in this for like 50 years <laughs> yeah. and pay 1.5%. I think they know that. So I think that there's a lot of people who are going to remain captive. So I do think there's probably a ceiling on the outflows or a, a basement, if you will. Um, but GBTC reminds me of an active mutual fund. It, it's going to see outflows, you know, ongoing. Again, active mutual funds also benefit from two things. And that's why you haven't seen much consolidation is A, the people are stuck in there because of taxes. So there's a bunch of people captive in active mutual funds who just don't want to realize the gains because they've been in there for 30 years. They're sitting on a big tax bill. And the second thing is, even though they've lost customers to cheaper ETFs, the market's tripled. So active mutual funds on the equity side have more assets than ever. Um, simply because the market went up, I call it the bull market subsidy. So GBTC, and I'm not sure if they this went into their calculus of keeping 1.5%, but if it did, it makes sense in my opinion, because they could be like, well, even if we lose half of our customers, if if Bitcoin goes up like 100%, we, we will have just as much assets and have just as much revenue. And because that's a, it's a rare business where you can lose customers and make more money, but that happens if the underlying goes up. So I know Grayscale's bullish, but Bitcoin, and they know ETFs are a big like Oracle to make money come in. So it's an interesting gamble. I, I never thought of it. The guy from, um, I forget, Decentralized News or something brought this up. And I was like, that's a good point. So I just think GBTC is playing the part of an active mutual fund. So to your point, I do think some people are switching. But GBTC is special because there was an unlock with all kinds of other stuff going on. Hmm. Okay, I want to sum up where I think we are so far, which is we're trying to get a sense of the money that has flowed in. And every one of us has seen these charts of the amount of AUM that gold ETFs attracted versus Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's like the straight shot elevator up. And uh, the question is, how many of those people, inevitably, like at least my opinion here, not to editorialize that, Bitcoin will go down again at some point and some amount of people will leave. Um, and then the question is like, how orderly is that process going to be? And Jim, I think what you're saying is the cash create um, structure of these ETFs could cause a problem. And Eric, I think you're saying you are just a little bit less worried about that. Here's something that I would like to get your guys' opinion on. So I've actually been talking to a couple of um, my buddies at some of these big sort of crypto shops. And they also confirm that, okay, the RIAs, like the wirehouses, all of that infrastructure, that's not really set up now, but it is coming. So what would you two think about the possibility that, yeah, maybe there are a lot of sort of these hot, either retail flows or speculative hedge fund flows that are moving in right now, but eventually that actually does turn into these real RIA sort of structurally passive flows on the allocator side, Jim, to your point. Because if there's one thing that I've sort of observed for being in crypto this long, so that more prices, act, higher prices lead to higher demand. And so I do wonder if after like six months, six months of this, the wirehouses have time to get set up. And now maybe that's a negative because they FOMO in at the wrong time. But what, what would you say about, okay, maybe it's hot money right now, but that actually does turn into the real, you know, structurally passive RIA type flows that we've all 
wanted these things to be. I guess I'll go first. I'll be. I'll try and be short. Um, I agree that you will see you will see some more passive money come in as the as the wealth managers start opening it up to their networks more and more. Um, but I guess really the question is. I'll come back to what I said before. The reason you go to a wealth manager is you don't want to be poor. You already have your money. You you don't want to be poor. So how many of these wealth managers are going to call up their wealthy guys and say, you should put some money into this speculative hot sauce thing, to use Eric's no, uh, uh, analogy, I like that a lot, as opposed to how many wealthy people are going to call their their manager and say, put me in it. And the the information I'm getting is not very many wealthy people are calling their managers and saying, put me in it. So the really the question then becomes, once these are put on to the Merrill network or Vanguard eventually comes along or, you know, with it or LPL, or I guess LPL is on it already, um, or whoever else is not out there that put, comes onto it. I guess the question is, how many managers are going to say, I got to put you in it, as opposed to wealthy people calling their manager and saying, put me in it. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be more wealthy people saying, put me in it. And those numbers are going to be very low. And yes, over a period of, and I want to, two, three, four years, I think that they will eventually come around to it. And eventually that money could eventually become more stable money, but it's going to take a long time. Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, one of the metaphors I used when this first launched that I was a little proven wrong on was I thought I thought the retail minnows were gone. I thought after SBF and um, and and if they wanted crypto, they'd be on the Coinbase or something already. I thought because Bitto launched into like retail fever. That was October 2021. That was the high, last high. And I thought, okay, I'm, it seems like a lot of those, the retail interest probably has been, they're either gone or they've been satisfied somewhere else. But the bigger fish are advisors, but they take longer to bite and they're going to sniff around the bait. Like if you've ever gone fishing, it just takes longer and it's harder to catch big fish. So I agree that advisors will take a long time. So there's no disagreement there. They also move slow. Um, I don't know how many advisors will. It's interesting because will they call their their people and say, I've, you know, I've got something to put you in? I think probably for now more so they're just going to field inquiries. And, and help them sort through it and give them the allocation. I think that's largely where we're going to start. The, the thing about advisors, though, is they are all looking for ways to be different than just like buying two Vanguard ETFs. So differentiation is part of what they do. And so if they can be like, hey, look, there's this Bitcoin ETF, I, can, I have access to it. Um, it might help them. It also might help them look cooler because a lot of the boomers who use advisors um, they may not even be into Bitcoin, but their kids might be. And the advisors have this issue of like losing the money when the kids inherit it. So Bitcoin may, for certain people, be a way to keep the younger, the kids of the advisors with the advisor. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you have advisors who are friendly with the issuers, like that's why I tagged you on Matt Hogan's tweet. I mean, they're like basically going across the country in a car, like the movie Tommy Boy. And they're knocking on all these advisors' doors. And that's just one issuer, and they're not even that big. So you got BlackRock, Fidelity. You know, there's an army of wholesalers who know these advisors. And I think that matters. Some of them, these advisors are, are sellable. Like you just, you, you can win them over. Um, they just need to be able to explain to their client. And I think also Bitcoin in an account would be a little sketchy, but, you know, BlackRock Bitcoin, a little safer. You know, we had this phrase on a team, uh, on our team that iShares and Vanguard ETFs are the new IBM in that, you know, how they used to say, if you own IBM as an advisor in like the eighties and nineties, you can't get fired. Like you can never get fired for owning IBM. It seems like iShares and Vanguard ETFs are that. You really can have a problem with your advisor if you, you're in those. So to me, having a BlackRock Fidelity and even some of the smaller issuers that are getting a name for themselves, um, this I think gives them some other cover, like feeling of secure and safety and the SEC approved them. So I do think there are more comforts and securities involved this time around to actually put the client in for put the client in because you're saying to them, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a risky proposition because if you, if it goes up to $500,000 a coin, you look like a genius. You're that got that client will probably be a client for life, but it's volatile. 
they also might be politically against Bitcoin or something. So I think some of this is, there's a lot to work out and this will take time for sure. You know, keeping in mind too, that I, I that's an interesting angle about the advisors trying to um, uh, differentiate themselves because typically now what they try to differentiate themselves with is tax, estate planning, you know, that kind of uh uh, that kind of stuff that's kind of boring and th that this would be way to differentiate yourself with something that's not as boring as talking about, you know, estate planning and, 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 and if, uh, tax efficiency. So that's an interesting angle I hadn't, uh, I hadn't thought about. Yeah. I think, um, we call them gadgets, you know, ETFs is just making all these new gadgets constantly and the advisor really should be up on all of them. So if there's like Jeppy and JepQ, I think were two interesting, this is covered call ETFs. Um, you know, the advisor can go, look, this is like investing in the market, but they have call options. So you get a 10% yield and a little downside protection. Um, and that's the latest gadget. And oh, guess what? JP Morgan makes it. So I got this institutional caliber management uh, strategy and I can get it for you. I just do think there's value in that. But to your point, um, the other stuff I think is where advisors are generally trying to make their value add for sure. Behavioral coaching, all that stuff. Um, but differentiation is I think a big part of it. That's why I think the ETF industry is making so many unique products and like the buffer products. It's, it, these are really interesting and clever ways for the advisor to add more value to their clients. Um, and you know, some of this stuff you could argue really is, is, at the end of the day, buying a 60-40 will outperform all of it, but there are unnatural variables in investing everywhere. And I think advisors need to have that relationship with their clients and like look like they're serving up value is a big one. The one thing I would say is it's possible to some advisors who look at not investing in Bitcoin as their value. Like they're like a Vanguard, like how Vanguard said, we're banning it. Like there could be some, like there could be a, a section of advisors who are like, I'm going to do you a favor and, and we're going to avoid this. Because again, if you talk to people, like I was an asset manager yesterday and I'm like, um, and they have some mutual funds. And I just saw Morgan Stanley put in a, in the prospectus, we, we might be able to buy Bitcoin if we want to, Bitcoin ETFs. And they put it in like 30 mutual funds, like just in case they want to. And the early owners of iBit are all mutual funds pretty much. So it's interesting. I think as a mutual fund manager, iBit might give you a little like, um, like a piston, <laughs> a little, a little return kick that was is small enough not to like, make you be noticed, but big enough to give you a pop. And that's interesting to me. But um, I was at a uh, mutual, mutual fund company yesterday and I asked them and they're like, no, our owner hates it. And that's that. So I just think this, there are definitely is a section of the country that thinks it's a scam, hates it, done. I think, I don't know if those people will ever get convinced, but there's probably some middle crowd here that doesn't have a strong opinion either way that price action and the, the wholesalers and all this could actually like move them to, to invest. Uh, time will tell, we'll see. Um, but I guess that's where I would stand on that. Can I ask you another quick question? I know Mike, I'm doing your job here. Uh, cause I got so many interesting questions. <laughs> Easy day. But yeah. Um, there's a lot of people in the crypto community that think that Buckley's retirement has something to do with, uh, with Bitcoin. I think it's, I think that's a way of you saying, Tell me I know nothing about the ETF industry without saying I know nothing about the ETF industry. Hasn't Buckley under Vanguard, you wrote the book on Vanguard, yeah. that's why I'm asking you. It's been an absolute juggernaut. I mean, doesn't Larry Fink wish he was Tim Buckley? He's done such a good job, or am I kind of overstating it? Yeah, well, Larry Fink is probably the one person who's okay with himself, but I think everybody else yeah, is jealous okay. of Vanguard flows. Um, Larry Fink, though, I think he might be jealous for one reason, and this is part of fascinating. Larry Fink has to serve shareholders, like the public stock owners of BlackRock stock. Vanguard doesn't have to do that. And this is why I think they went into Bitcoin. I think they were like, ESG was a loser. We need new revenue sources because we're fighting Vanguard in the core and there's no money to be made there. So we have to subsidize our fight against Vanguard. So Vanguard to me is actually overshadows everything going on in asset management. I think they might have even motivated BlackRock to get into Bitcoin because They've got to have new revenue sources if they're going to have their stock price remain elevated. Otherwise, it's going to crash like T. Rowe prices and Ben Franklin stock, um, Franklin in particular. So Larry Fink has those problems. I bet he would like to not have those problems if I was guessing. Um, Tim Buckley, they're private. They're also a mutually owned company. They're just built different. And 
they don't they don't give a they don't care about revenue really i mean they do but they don't um they they effectively because the the people who are in the funds own the company they typically vote to lower fees instead of like do other stuff with the money so i think bitcoin is something that just is not really on brand for vanguard's investors most of them are fully invested in the idea of intrinsic value cash flows coupons and this is something the crypto community misses completely and i i see vanguard's point i think vanguard should let the bitcoin etfs trade trust their users to be adults and don't be like the nanny but to the crypto crowd they're trying to do a touchdown dance and saying that they got a scalp <laughs> like buckley messed with the wrong currency and i'm like okay first of all that's not why he's retiring at all i confirmed it number two i i i am blown away at the at the way crypto people blow off the 60 40. like do you know when you put your money into stocks like it's not some game it's like a company where people get up go to work in their cars they get into the office they do work all that work creates value which is translated into dividends and you get that like your money works for you it doesn't do that in in bitcoin that's a respect it's the disrespect there i feel is short-sighted and foolish. On the flip side, I think Vanguard a little bit too disrespectful to Bitcoin. Let it trade. No one, no one on Vanguard's platforms cares anyway. Um, they had to make a point or something like being, being very Vanguardian. I wouldn't have done it. I think they'll come around eventually. But I think both sides need to understand each other a little better and, and why they're investing in it. But the, the crypto crowd is picking the wrong enemy here. Vanguard has taken in this week more than all those nine ETFs have taken in since they started. Like they will eat your lunch. This is not like a foe to like, you, you're not gonna like, you'll never beat Vanguard because Vanguard serves up to 60-40 and you will never take over the core. So as long as the core is 60-40 is largely, Bitcoin is best gonna get a sliver of the big pile of money in America. But you should be happy with that. I would embrace the role as hot sauce. Plus, you don't want Bitcoin to be like totally reliant on everybody's like kids' college education. Vanguard is that's where their money is. So they're, I, I don't know. I think the two can live together, but I think that y Vanguard is th the cavalierness in which they were like making fun of Vanguard and thinking Tim Buckley had anything, this had anything to do with him resigning was crazy. Um, it's funny though, and I enjoy the crypto crowd. And when they say we got a scalp, I just laugh at it. Like, I don't find it like I have to reply every time. I just find it all kind of amusing. And I like their their energy, even if it is misguided at times. It's a playfulness. It's not that angry and occasionally it can be. But so I, I don't mind it, but I just think it's like, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit too disrespectful for Vanguard and what they've done, the flows they take in, and just the concept of like stock and bond investing, which is, it would be stupid not to do that. Like, I just think crypto 100% in, in Bitcoin, that just scares me. I mean, I, I just, I just, you really want to do that? One, uh, maybe additional bit of feedback on the 60-40 point of this. Like, some of this is just like the crypto crowd is super young. And I don't think, I don't think actually a lot of them have a problem with the 60. I think they have a problem with the 40 on that. And like, that's how I, like, just as someone who has very, in a very different point in their lives than you guys. But if someone was like, you guys, you should be owning bonds right now. That's just like the least appealing thing in the world to me. So can uh, I make a quick comment about that? Um, the largest the largest pool of what we call long only money in the world is fixed income. Is more There's more fixed income money long only than there is um, in equities. Um, there's the capital structure. If you look at the capital structure, the bond, you know, who gets paid first when a company makes a dollar? The bondholders get paid first, then the junior bondholders get paid, and what's ever left over is for the equity holders. They take the most risk, they get to get the most reward. And I've heard the, the crypto crowd say that why do, why do bonds even exist? Why does anybody even own bonds? And um, they are, you know, we're you're looking at it as purely as this menu of investing options with potential returns, but bonds are loans to companies, is what they are. And those loans to companies are what make companies go. And because bonds are at the high point of the capital structure, if nobody wants bonds anymore, the bond market will make people want bonds. They'll drive interest rates, prices down and interest rates up so high 
they will kill everything else in its wake in order to get the bond market fed. So That's like really I good said, point. you know, like, you know, like I said, look, nobody wants bonds. Fine. We'll take interest rates. So up, we'll suffocate everybody else. till they give us the money that we need. So they eventually will get that money. So the bond market is a vital part of the capital structure and it will never not be. There was a really excellent episode. I'm going to refer to Dimitri Kerfinis' podcast here. I think he had Andy Constant and Mike Green on. And they were talking about basically exactly what we're talking about here, which is Dimitri had the opinion that I would rather buy a stock, like something the S&P 500, because I feel like I understand it. And I think it was Andy's point that there are bonds in those stocks. And I think that's what you're describing here, right? There is yeah. a, I, I understand the point there. Uh, but I think, I, but again, I think this is like, there are two, there are two responses to this, which is like, one, it does depend on what point in your life, right? If investments yeah. are a menu, right? It doesn't really make sense for someone who's young to well, take, like, you want the thing that's steady and, let, let me or if you go to a wealth manager, you go to a wealth manager and his mandate is don't make me poor, you know, investment grade right. bonds is a good way to accomplish that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And the, the reason to start young though is compounding. So even though I get mocked for saying I only expect seven, eight percent a year in return, I do. I'm happy with seven, eight percent of a 60, 40. That's a good year, an average year. Sometimes it'll be a little lower, sometimes higher. And because I found that the expectations of the Bitcoiners are really high. Like they want like 10% a day, right? They're like, they're very, uh, and you know, the road, what is it? The road to hell is paved with high expectations. Guy would be very careful, head, whatever, something. And um, I think that uh, the compounding of seven, eight percent a year, once you get a, a decent base, the compounding is, is the magic. And I, I think people understand that. I don't know. But compounding at 7 8% a year is awesome. But the earlier you start, the bigger the payoffs get later in life. So that'd be my counter to not starting young. But just saying. So Eric, what, what, or Eric and Jim, why do you guys think in general younger people are opting into crypto more and more? Like people, under, people like generally get this like Warren Buffett compounding interest sort of thing. Like what, what do you guys think the, the appeal is for, from the crypto side of things? You know, there's a lot of appeals. I'm going to answer your question a little bit differently, uh, Mike. There's a lot of appeals to to crypto. Um, you know, is it uh, Joe Weisenthal actually was kind of making fun of uh, the crypto community on what's been happening, and I kind of agreed with everything he said. That's why I brought it up. Is that we always have these narratives with crypto, right? That the you know it's going to be the world computer it's going to be the leading edge of web3 it's going to introduce the metaverse to everybody it's going to be sound money um it's going to be an alternate financial system um what i fear now is that they've kind of thrown all those aside and they said it's now just number go up and that's what Weisenthal was saying okay at least you guys have pulled the mask off it's just you just want number up that's really what the narrative is right now as opposed to all of these other ones but i do think that there's probably a a uh, 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 thing about young people that they're always up for something new, something different. And this is definitely, crypto is definitely new and definitely different. There might be some nihilism about the current state of the affairs when they hear about budget deficits and they hear about debt and they hear about, you know, the problems with the current financial system or the problems that we've experienced over the last several years that they feel like that's not going to be there for when they're our age or my age. And so therefore they want to transition themselves into something different. I guess those would be kind of my guesses as to uh, why they're now I'll just answer finally by saying the reason I'm here is because, or I'm bullish and I love the space and been in the space for seven years is that I believe in the alternate financial system. I, you know, DeFi was the thing that really got me going um, as a TradFi guy. And I'll be very simple. Two billion people live in Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and they live in regimes that have lousy currencies that constantly get devalued and corrupt financial systems. And if you want to bring to them a digital currency that has a that has a hard cap that no one can, you know, really monkey with and bring to them an alternative way to own it, trade it, transact in it, and that would be some version of DeFi whether it's going to be on the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, or whatever, Tron or, or Solana, whichever one you want, or some other one, I'm all in on that. And so that's where I definitely think that uh, the, the, the space should go. My concern is there's a lot of people that are building and developing on that. 
that this shiny new toy is going to take attention away from it. Why should I give money to a VC? Why should I give money to a new protocol? Why don't I just put it in IBIT and watch it just go up 10% a day? It's easier. It's simpler. Um, the, you know, investing, investing in angel investing or VC investing is hard and that, and, and it's uncertain. Why don't I just plow it into this thing? And I think it's going to suck attention away from it. And also, I've heard people on the blockchain say to me, oh, this is going to be the gateway that the rich guy with the Porsche is going to buy Bitcoin and it's going to go up and then he's going to open an electronic wallet. No, it's going to be the opposite. He's going to say, this is better than my electronic wallet. Why don't we close all the electronic wallets and move all the money back into our um, into our Fidelity account and buy FBTC uh, because it's simpler. Besides, I need cash anyway to buy all the toys that I want to buy. And so I think it might actually draw money away from it, not move money towards it. So I know I got a little off your question by trying to answer your question, uh, but uh, I'd be interested in what you guys' uh, opinion is. I know, Eric, you've got to hop in one minute. Jim, maybe you and I can hang back. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but Eric, I don't know if you want to give a closing response yeah. before you go. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of the guy, I would say in the Porsche or whatever, like saying, hey, this is actually better than trading it, trading Bitcoin. Like this is the better way. Again, this is something I was trying to convey to the people who were like, oh, it's underwhelming launch. ETFs are powerful. They are a technological marvel. And again, I think that once you use, like we've seen it, once people use them, they're like, that was really easy and convenient. I'll use it again. It's like they get repeat customers because they're just they're just so good, fast, good, cheap. You can normally get two of those three things as a customer. ETFs, you kind of get all three. And it's powerful, even as Bitcoin is a de- uh, supposedly a disruptor. I think this is showing off ETFs disruptive powers a little bit because I do agree it, it's actually going to be easier for most people to just trade the ETF or use the ETF. Um, the idea of the uh, VC money I would say in that you, you do have a point, but Coinbase and these in, these exchanges, I think also were trying to play the role of the ETF for a while. You just use the exchange. Why do I, you know, why do I need to invest in anything else? I'll just invest in this exchange. So I think there's, it wasn't like ETFs invented, like outsourcing the pain of buying Bitcoin. That was around before. I think ETFs evolved it and they're a better evolution. But I think the idea of like supporting the Bitcoin community is, is important. Some of the ETF issuers are trying to do that. Um, and, but I think you're right. Like the more convenient and easy it is, the less that money might be there, I think. But on the flip side, the higher the price goes up, the more there might be interest to support that. So I guess you could look at that either way. Um, there's one other point I wanted to make, oh, about why you buy it. Someone, um, this guy, I guess he was the guy who has got um, viral because he was like arguing with his daughter back and forth. Ben Hart, I think his name is. He said, he basically said, Bitcoin is the second amendment of money. And that I really, it kind of clicked something for me. I I understand what he's saying. Like Jim said, you can't, the government cannot monkey around with it. And I think people even feel like that way about the dollar, let alone a emerging market currency. And I think that's a powerful concept. I think most people can understand that. Like my mom can understand that. She understands the Fed prints money. She understands that like $35 trillion in debt is probably not good. These are these are things that I think the trollers miss. There are people who have genuine worry about how the government has created so much debt. And, you know, okay, it's not going to have be a problem today because America is such a thriving economy. But at some point, is there going to be some kind of a real issue with this? And will Bitcoin really hold up well? Um I get it. I mean, that's, and if you have something that is stores that value, then again, just like a gun, the government cannot take that from you. You have a protection. That's the whole second amendment's about is to protect yourself from the government. So that's an interesting concept. And I respect that argument. I also think if you're young, you like stuff that goes up and down a lot because then you can look at your phone and it's entertaining ROE return on entertainment. I think it's got a high ROE. And there's cool tech talk about it. It goes up and down. The memeing is great. The community is great. I can really, it's a scene. You know, back in my day, speaking of Gen X music, be like, uh, you know, there were scenes around certain bands or types of music. Like they would say, oh, that scene downtown or over here. It's a scene and it's a fun scene. Uh, So I think it's also part of the appeal. It's not just a currency or a a number on a screen. Um, It's a whole community. 
Uh, so those would be other things that I think make it appealing beyond the quote unquote use case or narrative or whatever. I think all that plays into it. But I sometimes think that the way a boomer would go, oh, Ponzi scam next. There are some crypto people who say that about the 60-40. And I, I think both of them should take the time to kind of understand each of those investments. I think they come closer together. I don't think either of them should be written off that easily. So I think they're almost like two sides of the same coin. I agree with that, Eric. Yeah. Um, and I know I know you've got to hop here. I have, I have a lot of responses to what both of you guys just said, actually, but um, I'm- yeah, um, I have a I have to run over to a conference. I'm on a panel uh, in about 20 minutes, so um, great to see you, Jim. Great to see you, Eric. And thank you for having me. And um, yeah. I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys online in, in shortly. I'm sure. First of all, let me just say I, I completely understand. I understand I'm further down the rabbit hole than I used to be, but like I can see both sides of this thing. You know, I. The, the perspective that I can completely understand is like, hey, there's this crazy crypto crowd that like jumps like a rabid animal on anyone that says a negative thing. And by the way, they're kind of factually wrong a good amount of the time, which doesn't really help. Uh, right. So there, there are these problems with that. But on the other side of it, I think the crypto crowd has understood something deeply and been very right about something that has been largely mocked and ignored pretty consistently for like 15 years. And so there's this sense of being the underdog. And I, I think that's like what these two things are bumping up against. And obviously, both sides have an enormous amount of merit. So here's what I wanted to make this point about ETFs. And I, I'm going to push back a little bit on something that Eric said. And you know, he's not here to defend himself. So everyone in the audience just take a hold of that. But I don't view the ETFs as a better way of holding these assets. Um, I actually kind of view it as a negative because... At least from A1, you have to pay fees, right? So just right off the bat, even if the fees are low, that's still much more than you'd have to pay for holding the underlying. The underlying of Bitcoin and ETH are actually, for like mom and pops, right? Liquidity isn't a thing. If you're a massive, you know, one of these sovereign wealth fund type entities, you want to put hundreds of millions of dollars to work. Although Sailor shows that you can do that already in the underlying. And I think these stuff are only going to get bigger. They're only going to get more liquid. And then there's the other perspective that exactly what I think you're alluding to, which is if you hold your Bitcoin in an ETF, then you're subject to, frankly, these like kind of crappy, like you have so much freedom. If you haven't like played around sending Bitcoin or Ethereum to like other exchanges and wallets, it is so free. I mean, now using a, a bank just feels like a, feels like dial up internet. I mean, it's, it's a much worse user experience. And, and honestly, there might be a whole cohort of people that that just never resonates with, but I think it will resonate with the new cohort of people that are growing up now. And, you know, to your point, Jim, about people coming into the Bitcoin ETF and then never doing anything else, I would dispute that pretty strongly. And the reason I dispute it is because I don't think this is a new trend. I think this is the acceleration of a trend that's been there since the very beginning of crypto, which is the way that most people experience Bitcoin or Ethereum is in a centralized form first. Like almost no one, maybe no one, like starts by going right to MetaMask. Everyone does a centralized exchange thing. They get on Coinbase or Kraken or Binance or whatever it is. And then they just hold their Bitcoin and ETH for a little bit of time. And then eventually they figure out that they want to do more stuff with that that's not on a centralized exchange and then they move their stuff off. And a huge difference, again, because you know we're tempted to just talk about this stuff as if people are making like ideological decisions here. But but really, the the infrastructure for on-chain wallets, like even the stuff that Coinbase just released this week, is like night and day difference from what it used to be. And so I think a lot of those UX reasons why like that kept people off actually using the stuff and interacting with it directly, I think they're just getting degraded over time. And you know what? Ultimately, at the end of the day, from a high-level philosophical standpoint, the whole purpose of these platforms is to be permissionless. There will be different wrappers for these assets, and they should fit the demand of whoever is using them. And it would weirdly be anti-ethos of Bitcoin to say, this isn't the right way to use this. You can't do an ETF. The whole point is that anyone can use these things however they want, is sort of how I feel about it. And so that's that's how I feel. Like, I, that's, yeah, that's my feeling. So let, let, me, let me respond, and my response would be somewhat of a defense of what Eric said, too. Um, <clears throat> and let me, let me um, say it um, kind of bluntly. And let me, let me say it bluntly for a fact, and then let me try to fill it in. The ETF represents failure, and the failure represents 
is for 15 years, the industry has tried to, in a decentralized way, to get people to, you know, open up an account, either in a centralized exchange or a decentralized uh, wallet. And the minute these ETFs came out, there's been this explosion of interest. Now, we could argue whether it's, you know, um, strong hands or weak hands, fine. But there's been this explosion of interest. These people were telling you the product of centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges sucks. I don't want anything to do with it. You came to me and now you're seeing all of the potential that the industry had for 15 years to try and get those people online. Couldn't do it because they could never get the UX right. They could never get the UI right. And all of a sudden, these once and the ETFs did. And that's why they were exploding in all this interest. Why they would then decide, because this is a different type of person. This is a person that already rejected Coinbase and Kraken and Gemini. They've already rejected MetaMask and Ledger. Otherwise, they would have been there. Why all of a sudden now that they're in the ETF, are they going to say, how do I open up a Gemini or Kraken or Coinbase account? How do I move to MetaMask or Ledger? They're not going to. They're not going to. I think they're going to stay right where they are. Because at the end of the day, they view this not as an alternative. They don't view it like Sailor, where Sailor famously said that Bitcoin is the end game. He was asked a question, the ultimate transfer, ultimate tradfi question, right? What is the end game? And he said the Bitcoin is the end game. See, for most of these tradfi people that are investing it, the end game is when do I sell it and buy the lake house and the Porsche to drive to it? And I need dollars to do that. That's their end game. So why would I tr- why would I meander off into a ledger when eventually I'm going to want to buy that lake house if you believe that the price is going to go to five hundred thousand dollars or something? That's why I don't think they're going to go there. And I think that some of the people that were kind of halfway there that were on Coinbase and uh, they're going to look at the ETF and go, man, maybe I just move back to my Fidelity account and do that. I think that it might pull them in that other direction because it's that type of person that is investing in this stuff. Um, so that's really where I, you know, I, I've been, you know, that's what I mean by it represents failure. The, look at all the trading. Why weren't those people at Coinbase, at Kraken, at Ledger, at MetaMask before January 11th? Because they rejected it. They wanted the product, but they rejected the way to get it. And now that you gave it to them in this format, they're going to like it. They're not going to move. And I think that you might see it go the other way. Mm. All right. I'm going to, so a couple of responses to that, which is one, this, so what we're looking at here is this is a chart of something called Bitcoin dominance. It's kind of a silly metric, but what it is, is it's the percentage of the overall total crypto market cap that Bitcoin represents. And if you're not following along on video, this chart is, in my opinion, down only and going to continue to be down only for basically the rest of time. Because this is where I just disagree with Sailor. I just don't think that Bitcoin alone is the end game. I just, I've never believed that. I think that basically these things are computing systems with different sets of trade offs, and there's going to be much more wide adoption than this. And one thing that um, you're, you're probably right, Jim. Honestly, there's probably a really large cohort of people that are just going to buy their Bitcoin ETF and they're never going to buy anything other than Bitcoin and they're just going to stick there. That makes a ton of sense. But one thing that I've heard people talk about that I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of is that Bitcoin isn't really a young person's asset anymore. Like young people don't get into the space and buy Bitcoin for the most part, I don't believe. Most people get into the space and right now maybe they do Ethereum and then they go and buy all this other stuff. But that's what I'm talking about. SHIB and and Doge? Uh, Are you talking about? I'm talking about real, I'm talking about real like Uniswap or Aave or Lido or any number of like actual real companies and um and or real products, I should say, where there's real innovation going on. And I think that percentage of the market is only going to get larger. Right now, yes, it is. It is SHIB and it's Doge and it's all those things. But I just I don't view that as a permanent phenomenon. Like there's something very real here under the hood. And I think basically this is just a, um, I don't think it's as nuanced as TradFi is going to completely win or that crypto is going to completely win. I think these things, if you want to close your eyes and picture something in your mind's eye, have you seen those animations of two galaxies colliding? That's what I think is going to happen here. And the structural advantage of a black rock is that you're absolutely right. They can slap their Bitcoin in an ETF. And if you're someone who like doesn't really understand this stuff and you just want to close your eyes and buy and you get the safety of BlackRock, like 
BlackRock's going to win that market all day, every day. I'm saying on a 20, 30 year long time horizon, I just don't think that's going to continue to be the case. And on a shorter time horizon, what I think is that people are moving in and they're buying stuff other than Bitcoin. You can actually just see it. It's just Bitcoin is a lower and lower percentage of the total crypto market cap over time. That means people are buying other stuff. I think that trend is only going to continue for the next 20 or 30 years. And the innovation in crypto, BlackRock can't keep up with that innovation. They can't launch you know, some sort of structured product which allows you to buy Aave, unless something crazy changes in the US in the next two or three years. And by then, there are going to be other products that end up winning that market share. And that's just what I truly believe. Yeah, I, you know what? I think you're 100% right. And I want to, and, and that drives me to, to something I was hinting at earlier. What is the use case? What is the purpose of Bitcoin? And, you know, what I fear with the ETF, what I fear with the ETF is now the purpose is number go up. Everybody pile into the, pile into the um, ETF. The float's too small. We're going to drive the coins to the moon. But that's an exit strategy. If that's really what you want, you're going to be looking to sell because eventually I fear the other side might be ugly. You know, it's just what I'm talking about is volatility, not that we're going to go into a new permanent winter or anything like that. We're just going to have insane volatility. And then we're really going to scare off TradFi that, you know, it's out of, it's an out of control casino. But if Bitcoin is supposed to have a real use case where it's the alternative financial system, that's what I think you're seeing with the dominance chart falling because Bitcoin itself has been very slow to adapt. What, they just came up with BRC20s. They don't really have any L2s, no roll-ups or anything like that that you see on some of the other chains. Solana, even though I think it's a little too centralized for my taste, but that's my opinion, um, it has really been <coughs> successful in that, that the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain hasn't been really evolving. And they're kind of having a civil war, aren't they, between the maxis and the people yeah. that want to try in. They can't even, they can't even agree among themselves whether or not they should be pushing BRC twenties and level to L twos and stuff, as opposed to what you see on ETH and Tron and Solana and the rest of them, if that's the way you're going to go, I'm all in. Let me give you a quick analogy to that. Why did AI take off? It was very simple. ChatGPT. ChatGPT put the light. Oh, now I get it. I see what AI is going to be. Let me jump in. You gave them a use case. Even though ChatGPT is not ready for prime time, you gave them a use case and they all went in. Same thing happened in the late 90s with the internet. Once they saw the Netscape browser, they, the light bulb went off and said, I get it. This is not ready for prime time, but I know where this is going to go. And we had the mania and everybody went in. The use case for Bitcoin and the use case for crypto cannot be, it's hard money, it's got a $21 million cap, and it's number go up. It's got to be something about an alternative financial system. Is it NFTs? Is it DeFi? Is it something else along those lines? Because if you're going to tell me it's the $21 million cap and it's the lack of inflation, then go sell it in Argentina and Brazil and Venezuela, because that's where they need it. They don't need it in Greenwich and Palo Alto. There, you know, that's why the people here in the United States turn their nose up and say, but our financial system is fine. And I'm like, yes, it is compared to the rest of the world, but 75% of the world, or maybe 90% of the world doesn't have our financial system. And so build that financial system. And that's why I think you see the dominance falling is because the dominance is falling because that's where the building is going on outside the Bitcoin blockchain. But if all of a sudden it just becomes, like I said earlier, that's too hard, that's too uncertain, that's fraught with problems, I could just buy iBit and watch it go up. You know, and all of a sudden the, the VC money, they're not going to tell you that. It's just, it's going to be harder to raise money is what's going to happen. And so I just don't see people saying, I just don't see people saying, I bought Bitcoin, it went up a ton. I want to find a VC who's going to build the Uniswap version on the Bitcoin blockchain and invest in it. That, that it's not going that way. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be, don't bother with the guy building the, the Uniswap version on the Bitcoin blockchain, even if it is Hayden Adams. Don't even bother with him. Just leave it in IBIT and look at what you've done here. That's what I fear is going to happen with this. Okay. So you said, a, I, you said a lot of stuff that I really deeply agree with there. Although I will caveat that within the last four months, this, this trend has actually changed and might actually surprise you to know, there are twice as met the volume of Bitcoin NFTs is now twice what it is on Ethereum. So again, a small data point. And I was at ETH Denver last week and the amount of money that is flowing into Bitcoin L2s is 
enormous. It's huge. So this actually might be- But all that got set up before the the ETFs came. You know, this just didn't happen since January 11th. Right. So- Point just being that actually might be changing right now, but let's let's just scrap that and say like, okay, let's just say there's this future where Bitcoin doesn't innovate on that. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think there it really comes down to what you consider the successful end case for Bitcoin. Me personally, and, and here are my beliefs. Like I, I'm not going to speak for the rest of the Bitcoin crowd. I have never been a huge fan of this like blow up the dollar thing. I've never been like, I'm here because I I think that there actually is a problem with the United States dollar. Like, I'm not, I think there is a, Eric was sort of hinting at this, like, I get it. People have been calling for the end of the dollar forever. I don't think there's going to be the end of the dollar. Do I also think there are policymakers have been particularly reckless for the last 50 or so years? I think they have been. And for me, and I think you're just seeing that in the price of Bitcoin. I think enough people understand that at a simple level. Like Eric said, you don't have to be particularly like financially sophisticated to understand that 35 trillion in debt is probably not a great thing. It doesn't mean the end of the U.S. Probably no. Does it mean the end of the dollar? No. But do I want a way to, you know, not be held responsible to mistakes that I feel like were made outside of my decision making? Yeah, I do want that, and I think that's what Bitcoin largely is. Now, I think what I think your point to push on. So I don't view this like dissemination of the U.S. end of the dollar. I just don't think that's realistic, and I actually don't want that. What I want is for Bitcoin to act something like gold is supposed to act and be a check. On the on the U.S. dollar, like that's what I, like that would be for me a success case for Bitcoin. Now, your, to your point about there being an alternate financial system, I think there there's there's a nuance there, which is is Bitcoin censorship resistant. I mean, this is where you know it's really hard to know, right? If Bitcoin were to keep going up, is there some theoretical point where the U.S. would try to ban it, make it illegal? Then, if if that's the case, then yeah, Bitcoin has some work to do because having that locked up in an ETF would severely impede that use case. And then your other point about a financial system being built here, i that's the other part that excites me. Like, I think we are building an alternative financial system. It is looking like it's not going to be on Bitcoin. Like, it's probably going to be in these other things. And that's, right. but but for me, that's okay. They're, you know, people get really religious about this stuff. Like, these are all, again, if you like isolate these systems, they're just little computers that all agree to share the same software and we fight religious wars about what the computer should look like in each network but like for me it's all success it's all winning if this stuff ends up getting adopted so i broadly agree with you that it doesn't look like the financial system is alternative financial system is going to get built on bitcoin that doesn't i view this space holistically though and that wouldn't be if it got built on ethereum or solana and said that wouldn't be a failure case so a quick word about you know about blowing up the dollar um let me say it this way Here's how you do it. You take the weakest currencies like the Venezuelan Boulevard, blow that up. And then you take the Nigerians, uh, you know, their currency, and blow that up. In Afghanistan and blow that up. And and do, and then push them into this. The second to last currency that's going to go is the euro. And the last currency that's going to go is the dollar. If you're going to start with the dollar, it's never going to happen. Because what you want to do is you want to get 75% of the world that doesn't have the dollar, that has corrupt financial systems and has shaky currencies using this. And then yeah. we'll be forced to adopt it. But if you think, no, I'm going to start at the Greenwich Country Club and convince all of those people to give up the dollar and to give up stocks and to give up bonds and to go into cryptocurrency, they're the last people that are going to do it. And stop asking them to be the first ones to do it. I'm actually not asking them to be the first ones. I, I'm with you on that. I do not think that they will be. I don't. I never actually thought it was going to be them. Um, I, I think who it's going to be, and this was sort of behind my maybe leading question into, you know, why you think young people look at crypto. Maybe I maybe I like really look at the world through this too much this lens. But like the way that I look at it is just, you know, I'm like a mid millennial. You know, I we have a lot of Gen Z people working at BlockWorks. Like I talked to a bunch of my friends. I think the real reason people aren't interested in this- Do they get you warm milk and a, and a blanket too? You're the elder <laughs> statesman over there, right? <laughs> Honestly, yeah, my knees. Yeah, when a rainstorm is coming, they ask me about my knees. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but- When I, I was like, your age, do you have your when I was that on them? <laughs> actually, actually, you no. know, it's funny. We had, uh, we had an- they Get off my lawn. Reason. That's the other one you got to use too. I don't want to blow them up, but I was talking to this, uh, this intern of ours who was applying for colleges and- yeah, he was saying he's worried it's going to be tough. And I was like, don't worry, buddy, you're going to be fine. And he was like, well, it was a lot easier when you were applying. I was like, Jesus, like, I, I wasn't that, you know, that wasn't that long ago. And by the way, yeah. it, it was really hard when I was doing it too. But 
Mm-hmm. Um, I I think the I think the reason why, especially like younger people, rebel against sixty forty, and like to your point about, and I'm totally with you. Like when the last currency to be to blow up is going to be the dollar, but I think the thing before the mechanical blow up in f- financials or the dollar or something like that is a weird social blow up and weird social dynamics. And like that, I think is what you're seeing. And that's, to me, the part, this part of the story is all about the rise of populism. It's the rise of like financial nihilism. This is all part of the same thing. And honestly, policymakers have done a wonderful job manipulating the software of the financial system so that nothing has blown up and nothing is broken. But what they've done, I think, on the other side of the ledger is they've revealed how stacked the deck is and how unfair it is, right? Like, it's just, you know, you kind of, life works best when everyone thinks they're part of a fair, equal system. And I think they've sort of tipped their hand that it doesn't actually work like that. And again, I understand, like, if I were in that position, I'd probably be making a lot of the same decisions. I'd be trying to hold it together. I'm more just observing a phenomenon that I sort of see playing out, which is, I think that that's all part of this, you know? Oh, no, I agree with you. I mean, you know, the the, the two examples that come to, to pop to my mind that we all know is, you know, the Canadian truckers uh, two years ago when they just, you know, they started freezing their bank accounts. And then the other one was, um, you know, I mentioned him a minute ago, Hayden Adams, when he was, um, he was profiled in the Wall Street Journal, what, maybe 21 or something like that. And he he was the guy that was coming, the, the, the guy that was coming for the banks. Yeah. And like right after that, I remember him tweeting out that basically without any warning, Chase just closed his bank account and just sent yeah. him just sent him a paper check with his money. Here, here's the money that was in your bank. Goodbye, go away. And that 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 inherent even that made me angry. The inherent un, un, unfairness of the current system, and that you know we have to go kiss their ring and make sure that we're always on good graces with them, so that they don't do that to us at any given time. We don't protest the wrong thing like the truckers did, or we don't threaten them like they perceived Hayden did, and then they punish us through the financial channel. And that is something that I think is a real problem and that they that the powers that be don't appreciate it and it will become a bigger problem if they keep abusing it. So to end this then, let me agree, let me agree with you a little bit by saying that you know, if you decide to hold your bitcoin in an ETF like that, it, any, any advantage that you had by holding bitcoin to opt out of that potential punishment, which I'm not really sure. It's almost more of a symbolic thing in reality than if you're like a U.S. citizen holding your Bitcoin on Coinbase. You do lose some of that benefit. Um, so I, I would, I'll end by, you know, I see your point there and and I, I agree with you as well. And I don't know, I just think, at the end of the day too, I don't think these are bad. I don't. I, I really just genuinely believe that most people aren't bad people and that um, right. like, I, I, I really, uh, my objective at least by, you know, devoting my life to this industry is not to uh, lead some sort of rebellion, you know, rip it all up and, and burn. I've just never loved that type of rhetoric in general. I, I just, I... History I, shows it usually doesn't make it better. It very no, rarely does. There's a great... Do you, do you ever read uh, Lessons of History, the Will and Ariel Durant? It's a... It's really... It's a, Actually, they wrote like 10 volumes and then they condense it to 100 pages. And there's this great... Uh, they do these The original of TLDR? <laughs> yeah, the TLDR, and yeah. they talk about these periods of time where you had to do wealth redistribution, and it's like you could either do wealth redistribution, or you could either redistribute wealth to the masses, or have revolutions which redistribute poverty. That line is always stuck in my head. So, anyway, Jim, we've gone on long so, enough here. So, uh, yeah, I'll just say something in thirty seconds. What Eric and I talked about, what we talked about, is what is happening with the Bitcoin ETFs is unprecedented in in ETF history. And that's saying something because it's a big industry and a lot's going on. And we don't really have the transparency that I could give you a plot. Here's the retail traders that have less than $10,000 that bought it. That data doesn't exist. What we have is informed speculation as to what's been happening. And when you get into this unprecedented with informed speculation, the law of intended consequences and the issues that we didn't see will always be there. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Eric's wrong. I, I, I tend to find, kind of funnily think that I'm going to be totally wrong. Eric's going to be totally wrong. And it's going to be something neither one of us thought is going to happen. But we are in uncharted territory. That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's pretty good right now. But it's going to be things are going to happen that no one anticipated. And that's what I've been trying to point out 
with the trading and my concern about weak hands and everything else. And maybe I'm overstating it. Okay, fine. I'm fine with, with um, you know, playing that role that I'm overstating it and I could be wrong on it, but we'll have to see. But what we're seeing is really unprecedented right now. Yeah. And again, I, I can see both sides of this and I'll actually give you an example um, from 2021 that's going to support your point. There was, you know, there's a firm called, uh, there still is a firm called Roofer. They're a pretty traditional hedge fund. They're based out of the UK. And there were a couple of the Ruffer. traditional fund Ruffer, thank you, Ruffer. Ruffer, yeah. Um, there, there were a couple of pretty traditional funds. One River was like the first sort of this vol sort of hedge fund, which announced a big buy of, I think it was Bitcoin and Ethereum back in 2020. And well, oh my gosh, you know, and then and then Ruffer followed them, I think with $600 million worth of either Bitcoin or Ether, some combination. And there was, there were two sides Two camps at that point. This was November 2020, and they said, and there were some people that said, "Hey, this, the, you know, this is tradfi. They don't have short attention spans or investment windows. These guys are holding it for the long run." And then there were other people that said, "Actually, they're probably going to sell it uh, when it goes up enough." And I was in the camp back then. Uh, I was in the first camp. I was like, "These guys are going to hold it for a long time." Well, in June of that year, they turned around and sold it for 1.1 billion in profit. I remember at the time just thinking, man, I can't believe they're doing that. This thing's going up forever, yada, yada. And it wasn't, and it didn't. And so I, I, there probably is some bit of analogy there right now. I think there is a data point that supports your point that it's not the RIA, you know, structurally passive money that everyone wants flowing into these funds. I think we can agree It will on be that. eventually. It will be eventually. It will be eventually, but it isn't right now. And so the question is, how much of that money flows out. And you can even look at assets like gold. There have been big outflow days. Like you'd be silly to not be preparing for that at one mm -hmm. point, I think. So anyway, Jim, as always. Oh, and if uh, folks want to find out more about you, follow the good work that you do or your own ETF as well, yeah. it's the best way for them to do that. So uh, biancoresearch.com is my research site at Bianco Research on Twitter or on uh, YouTube. Uh, my ETF is a long, fixed, long-only ETF. As Eric said, you know, he's happy with 7 to 8%. Uh, my ETF is hoping to, you know, give you a coupon of around 475 to 5% with very little risk. That is, as I pointed out, I know I'm talking to a crypto crowd, the largest pool of money in the world. Uh, that is WTBN, Whiskey Tango, Bianco, Nancy. And it's uh, at BiancoAdvisors.com is more about um, what my ETF is all about. Hmm. Awesome. Well, guys, definitely go check it out. Jim and Eric as well. Thank you guys both for coming on the show. This was a blast. Thank you. Thank you.